Um, when, since this month is Exalted Christ in the Old Testament, uh, last month was Exalted Christ in relationships, right? No. Yeah? Yeah. And so it's easy to see Exalted Christ in a relationship. It's easier to see, oh, this is how we put Christ in charge of our relationships. But when we think of Exalted Christ, when we think of proclaiming Christ in the Old Testament, it's a little harder. And so it's nice to know that when we read the Bible, that, as we know, the entire Old Testament points to Christ. That we know when we look at the Bible, when we look at this, that even when there is just this much of the Bible written, that it was going to Christ that when the world needed a Savior, God didn't just suddenly one day say, oh man, this world is really bad. They need to be saved. Jesus, go down there. Go save them. No, it wasn't. It wasn't just some random occurrence where God's like, you know, I did not, I did not have enough foresight to think that humans are going to be kind of bad and make mistakes. No, this is what exalting Christ in the Old Testament looks like. It looks like us seeing from the very beginning, from the very start of the Bible, before Christ, since like, a good half of the Bible, right up to nope, still going, and up to here. All this is about Christ. All of it. And it's, it's just amazing to know that before this was written, God had all this in mind. All of it already. And so it's nice to see a tangible proof that God had this in mind the entire time. And it's like we see small examples throughout all the Old Testament, whether we were learning about Joshua, the story of Joshua, or the story of Ezra, or when we look about the assembling of the army in Exodus, as we heard from Steve last week. Many, all the stories point to Christ, but this one that I'm going to be covering is, I think it's the first one that really points to Christ, or at least one of the first ones, and it's the most complete one, because most are just kind of an action representing like his blood or representing the cross, just representing small portions of Christ. But this one is, out of all the stories in the Old Testament, the most complete one. And this one is of Abraham and Isaac. And so let's um, go to Genesis 22. And so this is where I'm starting in Genesis 22. This is starting where Isaac's already been born, and God is already, he is just right now literally saying to him, I'm going to test your faith. And so let's jump back a little bit and see how even in the very start of this, this represented Christ, because we both know, um, actually, no, let me do a little reading first. So, 22. Later on, God tested Abraham's faith and obedience. Abraham, God called. Yes, Lord, he replied, take with you your one and only son. So let's stop there for a second. One, obviously, there's a parallel there with the phrase one and only son, as we know in John 3, 16. Perfect right there. But it's curious that in here it says one and only son when we know that Abraham had a child before Isaac. He had Ishmael. And so it's curious, why would, why would God say you're one and only son? Well, the parallel is, because I'm not just going to leave you hanging and say, go study the Bible yourself and figure it out. <laughs> The parallel is that Ishmael, as we know, was not promised. Ishmael was born out of Abraham's human error, as he had with the, the servant? Servant? No, like the house. Hagar. Hagar. What was she considering? I don't know. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, maiden. There you go. That's the word I was looking for. Like the maiden. She was not his wife. And so out of human error, he had a child with Hagar, and Ishmael was born. And so before Ishmael was born, God had promised to Abraham, he said, you're going to have a son with Sarah. <laughs> and Abraham being you know, nearing his first century of life, 100, he was like, I don't know if I'm going to have um, a kid with Sarah. It's like all the women in here who are above 60, I'm sure all of you are just like, I don't want a kid inside of me. And especially those who have already had a kid, you're like, I do not want to go through all of those hormones, all that just estrogen, all that uh, weird cravings at 3 a.m. I don't want to go through all of that again. 
And so Abraham scoffed at that. He's like, it's not, that's not gonna happen. And so he's like, let me just go with Hagar. She's nice and young, she's fertile, and she's attractive, and let's have a kid. So Ishmael was born. But that, as I said, was not the promised son. And so we see later on that, indeed, he does have a son. He has Isaac with Sarah. And that was the promised son. And it literally was a miracle. It was a miracle that a woman of her age in the 90s, let alone a man also in his hundreds, a centurion or whatever they're called, had a kid. As we look forward in the story, a parallel is with Mary. That is a miracle birth. She was born without being married and while being a virgin. And so both parallel each other in that they're both miraculous births. And they were both promised. Um, Mary was told that she will be the mother of the Savior of the world. And it was promised to Sarah that she will have Isaac. And so then we start there by saying that already there's a parallel. And so let's move on. There is, I'm not going to throw this to you, Steve, because there is a lot of like citation I could do with verses and parallels. And there's a lot especially in Matthew and some in like Hebrews and Luke. And so I'm not just gonna, I'm not gonna quote them all. Just trust me that it's in the Bible. Or actually no, I will quote them, but you don't have to go to them because there's a lot. And so we start out. Take with uh, you your one and only son, John 3, 16. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll point out to you. And so offering on a mountain, Matthew 21, 1 to 10, where we see where Christ was sacrificed. And I've read that a lot of, this one I actually was completely, did not know, that a lot of scholars agree that the hill where Isaac was to be sacrificed was the same hill where Christ was sacrificed 1,800 years in the past. And so 1,800 years, God waited and had this in mind just sitting there like, this is going to happen in 1,800 years. You're going to be sacrificed on this exact same hill. God had this in his mind this entire time. And so, um, uh, chapter 3, or verse 3. The next morning, Abraham got up early, chopped wood for a fire upon the altar, saddled his donkey, and took with him his son Isaac and two young men who were his servants, and started off to the place where God had told him to go. I'm just going to read through the entire verse and then just go back and quote all the things that are parallels because there's a lot. This is the most complete representation of Christ, the most complete prophecy of Christ to come. Uh, verse 4. On the third day of the journey, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the young men, and the lad, uh, and, the lad and I will travel yonder and worship and then come right back. Abraham placed wood for the burnt offering upon Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the knife and the flint for striking the fire. So the two of them went on together. Father, Isaac asked, we have the wood and the flint to make fire, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? God will see to it, my son, Abraham replied, and they went on. When they arrived at the place where God had told Abraham to go, he built an altar and placed the wood in the order ready for the fire, and then tied Isaac and laid him on the altar over the wood. And Abraham took the knife and lifted it up to plunge into his son Isaac to slay him. At that moment, the angel of God shouted to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Lord, he answered. Lay down the knife. Don't hurt the lad in any way, the angel said, for I know that God is first in your life, and you have not withheld even your beloved son from me. From me. Then Abraham noticed the ram caught by its horns in a bush. So he took the ram and sacrificed it, instead of his son as a burnt offering on the altar. Abraham named the place Jehovah Provides, and it still goes by that name to this day. Then the angel of God called again to Abraham from heaven. I, the Lord, have sworn to myself that because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your beloved son from me, I will bless you with incredible blessings and multiply your descendants into countless thousands and millions, like the stars above you in the sky, and like the sands along the seashores. These descendants of yours will, con will conquer their enemies and be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. 
all because you have obeyed me. So they returned to so they returned to his young man and traveled home again to Beersheba. So, as we're looking through this, since that was just a large chunk of uh, Bible to read, we see parables. Almost literally every single verse, almost literally every single sentence, we see a parallel. Going back to 22 verse 3, where he says, took a donkey to a place of sacrifice. In Matthew 21 verse 2 to 11, um, two men went with him. Mark 15 verse 27, or Luke 23 verse 33. The two men there are sacrificed next to Jesus. Um, a three days journey, when we're in Genesis 22 to Four. I don't even need a quote that Christ was buried for three days. Um, the son carried the wood on his back up the hill, representing Christ carrying his cross all the way up. Uh, God will provide for himself the lamb. John 1 verse 29. The son was offered on the wood, representing Christ. And then a ram in the thickets of thorns, uh, representing the crown of thorns. The seed will be multiplied. John 1 verse 12 or Isaiah 53 verse 10. And then Abraham went down. Um, and his, oh, Abraham went down and his son didn't. And then Isaac is not mentioned. And we see that in Luke 23 verse 46. And it just keeps on going. Through this entire thing we just see parallels. And it's the most complete depiction and prophecy for Christ to come in the very, I think that's the very first one, I believe, because before that, literally, it's just God creating the world. <laughs> and so it is just amazing to see that the very start, since Abraham was kind of like the pioneer for knowing Christ, because prior to Abraham, no one really knew of Yahweh. Just one day, God spoke to Abraham, and he trusted him completely. And we see, even with Adam and Eve, that from there, God had Jesus in mind. We see that Christ is exalted in the Old Testament because everything, even this story about Abraham sacrificing or trying to or desiring to obey God and sacrifice Isaac is a depiction of Christ and him being sacrificed for our sins. And so when we look at this, we can look at it from one of two um, views. If we're looking at it from Isaac's view in our own personal life, we can think, when I have something in my life I care about, I know I can trust God that he's going to give me what I need. He's not going to force me to sacrifice something really important to me. Or if we're viewing it from the scope of Isaac as a child, we know that our father is going to take care of us. We know that he's going to be there for us during any crisis, whether there is literally a knife about to be plunged into us, we know Christ will be there. Amen? Amen. <laughs>